Hey guys, what is up and welcome back to the channel. It has been a hell of a long time since I've been able to take a look at any emulators to let you guys know about their latest updates and in this video I'm going to be taking a look at all of the new and improved updates to CMU emulator which we have been given in the last 4 to 7 weeks. This video is going to cover all of the latest changes in CMU versions 122.6, 122.7, 122.8 and the very latest 122.9 version which is currently only available to CMU patrons but will be available to everyone this coming Friday the 26th of March. Since we have basically two months of updates to cover, let's jump straight into it and start things off by taking a look at all of the latest general changes to CMU. First up, they have added a series of updates to how CMU handles its vSync and vSync events this first change makes the default vSync frequency or emulated refresh rate 59.94 to match the actual Wii U console's refresh rate. While this value changes the default setting for CMU, graphics packs are also able to set it to a flat 60 or even higher via modification. We've seen even more changes to vSync with the Vulkan API, we're going to be covering them in just a moment, for now let's continue with general changes. They fixed a series of small memory leaks and on top of this they also fixed a regression where the MLC path would be processed incorrectly leading to CMU not being able to load some files be it updates, DLCs or game saves from your MLC folder. They also fixed a crash that would occur when refreshing your games list. This would mainly happen when you were using WUD image format games when you did not have your keys correctly dumped. Moving on to some input changes. These changes were just added in the latest version 122.9. They have added support for the WGI or Windows Gaming Input API. If you're familiar with Dolphin Emulator, I believe they've had a PR open for this for a while now. This is basically a workaround or I guess a new version of X input for the Windows 10 system. This basically bypasses the 4 controller limit for X input. For example, in games that allow 8 players like Smash Bros, this is basically going to allow you to map 8 individual X input controllers, for example 8 Xbox 360 or Xbox One pads, whereas before you were limited by the X input API itself to only mapping 4. One limitation of this WGI API is that it is currently at least only available on the Windows 10 platform. Staying on input changes, they also gave us smaller improvements to the input settings within the emulator, specifically the input GUI. The stick preview now has a circle to indicate where 100% range of the emulated controller is. This will be very useful for people editing range and dead zone for their specific controllers. Now that we've covered input and general changes, let's move on to some graphical updates. This is going to cover GX2, OpenGL and Vulkan changes to CMU. First up, they fixed a length mismatch when processing set loop const pm4 commands. This fix resolves soft locks that can occur in Paper Mario Color Splash. They have also optimized how a texture readback happens in the emulator. This improves performance in The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild since it heavily relies on texture readback. This solves a performance regression in Breath of the Wild that happened all the way back in CMU 121.3. And thanks to this improvement, The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild's performance is improved by between 5 to 8% in the latest builds. I'm going to be testing this out in a video all to itself in the next few days. I'm going to be testing Breath of the Wild out on my brand new Ryzen 5 3600X system, so make sure to keep your eyes peeled for that one. Moving swiftly along, they have also fixed a bug in the texture decoder for micro-tiled MIP slices. This fixes, as you can see in gameplay right now, the strange black texture squares that would previously happen in Xenoblade Chronicles X. The latest builds have also reworked fetch shader generation to much more accurately reflect what happens on the Wii U console. This improves compatibility with games that are very picky about correct shader sizes. Of note, we're told that the fall is now considered fully playable since it no longer crashes on boot. 
We are also told that shader cache, shader cache generation and graphics packs are not going to be affected by this change. The final two GX2 changes are a correction to a bug in the calculation of texture pitching for the tiling aperture. This fixes corrupted textures that could occur in Super Mate Boy. They've also improved the robustness of the OS screen API. This now makes it compatible with GX2, whereas previously any drawn frames would be disabled from the OS S screen output permanently. This is mainly used and required by homebrew applications which mix OS S screen and GX2. Moving on to OpenGL and Vulkan optimizations, they fixed the generation of invalid shader code when accessing integer texture samples with certain parameters. This fixes an issue where the game screen was completely invisible in Virtual Console DS titles. By revising the internal swap chain management and fixing some synchronization bugs, double buffered vSync will no longer cause graphical artifacts when used with the Vulkan API. Speaking of Vulkan, this is the vSync change which I previously mentioned. They have added a new experimental vSync mode which you can find in the dropdown when you're using Vulkan. If enabled, CMU will match the vBlank event timing of the emulated display to the physical monitor to which CMU is being displayed on. This significantly reduces input latency and also avoids tearing by piggybacking on the emulated game's vSync implementation. We're told that for perfect results, the vSync rate in CMU should be equal to or slightly higher than your monitor's refresh rate. For example, if you're playing Breath of the Wild on a 60Hz monitor, you want to set the frame rate limit within FPS++ to either 60 frames per second or the next highest option. This is assuming that you're able to maintain a perfectly locked 60 frames per second. Any integer ratios like 1 to 1 to 3 or 1 to 4 should also give you very good latency and tearing results, for example running at 30 frames per second on a 60Hz monitor or running at 36 or 72 frames per second when using a 144Hz screen. While this new vSync mode is only available on Vulkan right now, they are planning to add it for OpenGL also in the very near future. Staying on some Vulkan changes for a moment, CMU's internal shaders are no longer going to show up in the overlay statistic as compiled X shaders. Unlike game shaders, they do not get cached and also do not cause any discernible in-game stutter. Our final Vulkan exclusive change fixes a crash that could occur when a game provides invalid texture sampler parameters. This resolves yet another crashing issue in Super Meat Boy. The next changes apply both to OpenGL and Vulkan. They resolved an issue where depth buffer clearers would use incorrect clearing values. This fixes invisible rendering bugs in Mario vs Donkey Kong and also fixes the invisible user interface in Dragon Quest X. By improving tracking and synchronization of overlapping memory in the texture cache, they have also fixed black screen issues in Call of Duty Black Ops 2 and by implementing support for shader operation sample CL, they have also fixed the missing lighting in Black Ops 2. And finally for video output changes, by fixing incorrect handling of mismatching frame pitch, they fixed broken video playback in Mario Party 10 and Pikmin 3 that could occur on some users' GPUs. Some pretty impressive stuff for GX2, OpenGL and Vulkan I think you'll all agree. The final few changes we have to take a look at involve CMU's HLE processes and core in it. The first of these HLE changes prevents Wind Waker HD from softlocking if someone were using the single core recompiler. They also have implemented a change that prevents dynamic resolution scaling from happening in Super Mario 3D World. This fixes a long-standing issue where mirror effects in level 1-5 would cause the texture cache to be flooded, leading to stutter, lower performance and even crashes on your system if not enough VRAM were available. Funnily enough, prior to this fix being implemented, Super Mario 3D World was actually running better on a Yuzu emulator than CMU due to this issue with CMU's texture cache. Moving on to our final changes, we're going to take a look at CMU's core init changes. They have added potential fixes for a mystery crash related to file operations and callbacks. 
This crash can most often be observed when loading saves in The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, though it can also happen randomly during gameplay. With this fix, they are hoping that this strange crashing issue is now solved. They also added an optimization to fix race conditions in thread deallocators. This fixes random crashes in many, many games. They've also added safeguards to prevent a state corruption when a game uses MP task queue improperly. This fixes Tokyo Mirage sessions freezing or crashing shortly after launch. Staying on Tokyo Mirage sessions, they also solved a race condition in their spin lock implementation. This dramatically improves stability in Tokyo Mirage sessions, though we're told that this fix is likely to affect many other games also. On top of these fixes to Tokyo Mirage sessions, they also fixed an issue where the priority of default core threads was way too high, leading to CPU starvation of the other threads. This fixes random softlocks in Yoshi's Woolly World. They have also improved the performance in Paper Mario Color Splash when using multi-core recompilers by optimizing niche cases in the Cafe OS synchronization primitives. Performance problems when using multi-core recompilers with this game have not been fully solved just yet. We've been told that we will see further improvements to this in future. Our final two changes are a re-implementation of the API OS is home button menu enabled and OS Enable Home Button Menu. This fixes Disney Infinity 2.0 crashing at launch. And our final fix is a stub for Upload Post Data by Post App. This avoids a softlock in The Legend of Zelda Wind Waker HD when using the Tingle Bottle feature. Oh, so there we have it guys, all of the latest and greatest changes to CMU Emulator from the last four versions alone. I obviously didn't want to leave it this long before covering CMU's updates, but since I moved house, set up a completely new office space, and have basically just been setting myself up for my new area of living, it took me a very long time to get settled and get everything set up. Thankfully, now that I have everything, I can cover every new CMU update as it releases, and as always, please make sure to be subscribed to my channel for when each and every one of those update videos releases. In the coming days, I'm also going to be covering the latest changes to the likes of RPCS3, Yuzu and Ryujinx emulators, and on top of that, I'm likely to also release brand new guides for most of these emulators. This includes CMU, especially so prevalent since they have released this new WGI input API support. For now at least, that's going to do it for this video. Once again, thank you all very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed looking at all of these latest changes to CMU emulator. As always, remember to like this video if you liked it, dislike it if you didn't, and subscribe to my channel if you want to see all future videos from me.